All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, my name is James Rulowski. I'm the Senior Clinical Education Manager for ClearFlow. Um, on behalf of the entire ClearFlow team, I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is the fourth edition of our webinar series. That's our ClearFlow peer-to-peer e-learning series. Um, I know I speak for everyone at ClearFlow uh, when I say that we're delighted to have Dr. Mark Gilinov, um, Chief of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery here at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, present for us today. Um, his presentation titled, Active Clearance of Chest Tubes in Cardiac Surgery. Um, Dr. Gilinoff really needs no introduction, as he's uh, obviously very well known worldwide for his work in the field of cardiac surgery, as well as numerous publications, other contributions, uh, as far as videos, textbooks, and so on. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Gilinoff so he can begin. And again, doctor, thank you so much for taking the time to do this for us. My pleasure. Just finished doing a case, mitral valve repair, the guy's a little wet, and he's going to have active clearance and he will not tamp and nod, and he will do better because of it. You'll see on the title slide, active clearance of chest tubes and cardiac surgery, and there's a question mark. The question that people have is, do we really need this? And if we do need it, why do we need it? And we're going to answer those questions by telling you, yes, we really need it, and explaining the benefits. Why did I use it this morning here at the Cleveland Clinic? Why do we use active clearance? When we've had plain old chest tubes for decades and decades and decades, we're going to show you plain old chest tubes are not reliable. And if you do a complex cardiac operation and you leave this detail to chance, you're taking a risk. We know that when we do heart surgery and also general thoracic surgery, all patients need drainage. We don't want retained blood and blood products in the chest. So in cardiac surgery in particular, Every single person who has cardiac surgery, whether it's robotic surgery, sternotomy surgery, right thoracotomy, partial sternotomy, whatever, every single one of them gets a chest drain left. That's nice. That's good. We know we placed them correctly. But the question that we had some years ago is, do these drains actually work? Can we rely on the drains to adequately evacuate retained blood? We are all familiar with these pictures. When you're an intern or a second year resident in the ICU, one of your jobs is often pull the chest tubes. And of course, patients don't enjoy the sensation. And that's what we tend to pay attention to, that the patients, we cause them some pain when we do this. But we've all looked at the chest tubes when we pull them, and we've seen this. We have seen tubes that are filled with clotted blood. And one thing we don't know is, when did that happen? Was that 30 minutes? After the operation, was it on arrival to the ICU? Did it happen in 3 in the morning? We don't know exactly when it happened, but we do know that this is an extremely common picture. A patient had heart surgery post-op day one. You pull the tubes, and you get something like this. Who does this happen to? How often does it occur? We did a study at the Cleveland Clinic where we looked at CT scans that were obtained in patients who had heart surgery who still had their chest tubes. The CTs were generally performed for another reason. Perhaps they wanted to see the size of the aorta. Maybe they had some symptoms suggesting pulmonary embolism. So these were opportunistic CTs in a random assortment of patients who had cardiac surgery and also had chest tubes indwelling. We published this paper that details the results. And these are the results. Patients had cardiac surgery with chest tubes, 36% of them had complete occlusion of the tubes. So 36%, more than a third, the tubes were doing absolutely nothing. They were completely occluded. A lot of other patients had partial occlusion, meaning that the chest tube function was compromised by clot. The ones that were occluded were more common amongst the pericardial drains, which are the most important tubes. If someone accumulates a pleural effusion, not good, but I'm not terribly worried about it. Pleural effusions don't cause hemodynamic compromise. Pericardial effusions do. So people who accumulate pericardial fluid get pericardial effusions, may get tamponade, may need a procedure to drain it. That's more complicated, and these were the tubes that were most likely to clot off. Second thing we noticed in this study, in addition to clotted tubes and clotted tubes being pericardial tubes, was the people who had clotted tubes had an increased incidence of postoperative atrial fibrillation. And this was our very first recognition that there might be a relationship between retained pericardial blood 
and postoperative AFib. And we'll get back to that because postoperative AFib is a big deal. It's a major cause of morbidity and increased resource utilization and cost. But from this paper, this slide summarizes the findings. 36%, more than one third of chest tubes placed are completely occluded. These are chest tubes placed by us, by the heart surgeons. We know what we're doing. We know how to place them. We do a good job placing them, but the tubes don't do a good job of draining. In addition, as I noted before, you can't tell which tubes are open and which are occluded because 86% of the tubes that were occluded had the occlusion inside the patient, meaning you can't see from the outside. So the nurse, the doctor, the resident, the fellow, the anesthesiologist, the intensivist, they all come by, they look at the outside of the tubes and say, looks good. Tube looks just fine. What they can't see is if the little rectangular inset, what they can't see is that on the inside, often, 36% of the time, the tube is completely occluded. So it's almost as if there's a camouflage going on here or a trickery. We think we're doing well, but we're actually not doing well. The tubes are non-functional. So what? Tubes are non-functional. What's the problem with that? Well, there's a wide range, a very wide range of potential problems associated with these 36% of tubes that don't drain. Here's the progression of what happens. An open tube, great. If the tube gets occluded, obviously it's not going to drain and unclotted blood builds up outside the chest tube. It's still drainable at that point, but then the blood clots. Then it forms that gelatinous sort of material that is not going to be able to be evacuated by any sort of tube. And even if somehow you get the tube reopened, you've missed the opportunity to evacuate the retained blood, and therefore you've missed the opportunity to prevent a complication. So on this slide, when you get to the bottom two panels, you have left the patient with a problem that was 100% preventable. This led us to consider the costs of retained blood. And we coined a new term, retained blood syndrome after cardiac surgery. This is something we've known about forever. There's not a cardiac surgeon alive who has not had a patient with a pleural or a pericardial effusion, or need for decortication or pericardial stripping, all of it related to retained blood. Retained blood syndrome, we've defined broadly, is the need for any reintervention to remove blood, clot, or bloody fluid after cardiac surgery. And unfortunately today, with our traditional modes of drainage which are ineffective, this is fairly common. So what are we talking about? We're talking about people who have tamponade, pneumothorax, pleural and pericardial effusions, that's the physical manifestation of retained blood. This shows the retained blood syndrome, and there'll be three slides just like this. If you start on the left panel, adequate evacuation of blood, which is what we want, that's what we expect, that's why we put chest tubes. If we get adequate, adequate blood evacuation, we get recovery. What if we get inadequate blood evacuation, meaning we have retained blood? In the acute situation, which affects 3 to 6% of all people having heart surgery, you get tamponade or a hemothorax. We've all seen this. We've all seen patients are hypotensive. They have a high CVP. We're wondering what's going on. First thing that comes to a cardiac surgeon's mind is could be tamponade. We've also seen people. What's going on first to hear music. We've also seen people who have a um, whited out chest. And obviously, that is a problem as well, and it's going to require surgical drainage. So in the acute situation, you can tamponade or hemothorax. Now, as we move over to the purple area, if we fail to evacuate the blood at that point, we get subacute problems related to retained blood and clot. The clot causes inflammation. You get inflammatory cytokines released. You get more fluid being drawn into the area which leads to pericardial effusions and pleural effusions, what we call subacute retained blood syndrome. This affects anywhere from 10 to 13% of people, and that's generally going to require some treatment, specifically a drainage. And if you're the patient, you're not going to be enjoying this. Then finally, if we still somehow miss the boat and we fail 
to drain the fluid, you get constrictive pericarditis and fibrothorax. How common is this? Two to three percent of people. Who's had it? Lots of people, including Bill Clinton, retain blood in the chest, cause a fibrothorax, leading to a big operation, decortication. He disappeared from public life for a little while. When he came back, he didn't look so good. What he really needed at the very outset, going all the way back to the left, was adequate blood evacuation. If he had had adequate blood evacuation, he would not have needed a second major operation of decortication. When you lump all these together, acute, subacute, chronic retained blood syndrome, and then you look at large administrative databases, you know, including hundreds of thousands of people, you find that they're overall, in aggregate, pretty darn common. Talking about 15 to 20% of all patients having cardiac surgery have one or more manifestations of retained blood syndrome. We would love to just leave the operating room and say, you know what, the echo looked great, we're done. We did a fabulous job. That's not enough. It's really not enough. Got to pay attention to the details because if we leave retained blood, we get sort of a ripple effect. It starts with the blood, as we just showed. Large databases reveal 17 to 20 percent of patients recovering from heart surgery have retained blood, leading to things like tamponade, hemothorax, bloody pleural, and pericardial effusions. But that's just the first thing that can happen. The ripple effect then ensues. Once these events happen, we require significant hospital resources to take care of them, and we have major increases in morbidity and mortality. Mortality associated with this, not necessarily caused by it, but it certainly contributes. Mortality associated is doubled, and people who have retained blood that requires treatment have a much higher risk of postoperative atrial fibrillation, as we said before, and then a bunch of other major complications, including kidney injury, stroke, delirium, infection, they're in the hospital longer, and that leads to more costs and consequences. On average, the patient who needs an intervention for retained blood consumes an additional $28,814 in additional resources, which goes straight to the hospital cost. They have an increased length of stay, longer time on the ventilator, increased time in the ICU, more nursing time associated with them. More of them go to nursing homes debilitating to have your heart surgery, have retained blood, and then have additional problems. To us, thoracentesis, pericardiocentesis may not seem like such a big deal, but to the patient who has to wait in the hospital for that, go through another procedure, be NPO for another day, oops, the procedure is canceled, NPO for two straight days, it really adds up and compounds, and it costs the patient, and it costs the system. Our biggest complication in terms of frequency is postoperative atrial fibrillation. We and others have now identified that retained blood around the heart in the pericardial space is associated with postoperative atrial fibrillation. And this actually was important enough to make the cover of the Annals of Thoracic Surgery. The mechanisms are likely inflammatory or pro-inflammatory in nature, and we have a lot of animal models of atrial fibrillation, which inflammation around the heart causes post-op AFib. Well, we know that retained blood around the heart causes inflammation. Inflammation causes post-op AFib. So leave the blood, get more AFib. That's the problem. Have we got a solution? Yes, we have an excellent solution. Active clearance. Plain old chest tubes just don't work reliably. How hard could it be, we thought, to just keep the tube patent, roto root it out? Well, it turned out it's not quite that easy. You need to maintain a sterile environment. You've got to have the right sort of ability to clear the tube. So what we did was we took chest tubes and turned them into chest drainage systems. And what we've got now is a tube that has an internal element or member that you can use to floss the tube, more or less roto root it out. The end has sort of a pigtail or loop on it that breaks up the clot in the tube. And you have a magnetic drive on the outside, which enables you to move this flossing element, move it down the tube, move it back up, back and forth. Actually, you don't have to do it. The nurses do it. And they don't mind doing it. They like doing it because then they don't have to call you with tamponade, retained blood, chest tubes that aren't working. This keeps the tubes open. And from the outside, you still have a normal chest tube 
but the chest tube or chest drain on the inside is different in that it's actually patent. And the clearance member just goes in series such that you hook it up to your chest drainage canister and there you go. Active clearance technology just put in there in the middle to ensure that your patients do better. Some people might say, well, can't we just strip the tube manually? You can do whatever you want. Stripping it manually doesn't work well, and it actually creates enough negative pressure that it can possibly be damaging to internal organs. But basically, if you strip it manually, you still have no idea whether that tube is patent on the inside. And if you're going to take the trouble to do open heart surgery on someone and put a chest tube, you want the tube to be patent, you want it to drain. And right now, the only way to be certain that you've got a draining patent tube is with active clearance technology. It's so simple, so intuitive, and it works. But just to prove it, before we did this in people, we did experiments in animals in which we injected blood into the pleural and pericardial spaces, and we compared active drainage in blue to conventional drainage in red. And the plot to the left shows that we drain more of the instilled blood in the animal model with active drainage, the blue bars. Then to the right, this shows the retained blood after drainage, and you see very little retained blood, the blue bar is small, when we use active clearance. So in an animal model simulating cardiac surgery, it worked. Then we asked the question, can we use a smaller tube? If we have active clearance, can we use a smaller tube and get better drainage? So we compared a 20 French smaller pluriflow tube, that's in blue, to a conventional tube. If you just look at the plot to the left, we see much more volume drain with a smaller tube with active clearance than with a 32 French conventional tube. So what we've actually shown here is very interesting. We've shown that a small diameter tube with active clearance drains better than a large diameter tube, which is really nice if you do minimally invasive heart surgery, robotic surgery, right into a thoracotomy type operation. You don't have to make a big hole to put a big chest tube. You can put a small tube and be assured you're going to have good drainage if you use active clearance. So small tubes with this modality work. But don't just take my word for it. Here are 12 different studies looking at the impact of active clearance technology. We reduce retained blood, reduce post-op AFib, reduce take back for bleedings, or reduce length of stay. So we reduce a lot of bad things just by draining well, by draining correctly. In fact, based upon this data, the Enhanced Recovery After Cardiac Surgery Society gave active maintenance of chest tube patency a class one recommendation in terms of it's being effective at preventing retained blood. That's in green to the top left. Look over to the top right in reddish or orange. Routine stripping of chest tubes is not recommended. No benefit, possible harm, because routine stripping of chest tubes, first of all, doesn't work, and second of all, may generate high negative intrathoracic pressures that could be damaging. So the evidence really is very strong, very good for active clearance. Final question is, in whom? Who should get this? Should we be selective, meaning just put it in people who are bleeders, who have LVADs, or alternatively, should we be more comprehensive? I think of it this way. Is it more like a seatbelt or a fire extinguisher? Seatbelt, you use it all the time. Every time you get in the car, you put on a seatbelt. It's the law. So you're planning for safety. Fire extinguisher, you only use a fire extinguisher when there is a fire. So you wait for the disaster. Makes sense. Just do it in everyone because you want to be safe in everyone. Don't wait for the disaster. When is the most important? important or critical time to actuate the mechanism to do the active clearance early after surgery. That's when we have the most shed blood. That's when patients are bleeding. They're still coagulopathic. Sometimes they're cold. And in the first two, three, four hours, if the nurse is actuated every 15 to 20 minutes, they're going to keep the tubes patent. Whereas if they don't, when the bleeding rate is higher, you're going to get people who have tamponade. We tend to leave these in 24 hours but the first few hours are the key time. Now we've got some recent advances. This tube 
has a longer drainage length. It's got more eye holes or eyelets in it, such that in thoracic surgery, it's very useful because you're going to be able to drain more of the pleural space than you could with the older tubes that just have the eyelets for a few centimeters. And the, these are all soft tubes, by the way. They enhance patient comfort. And some of us like to put a right angle tube. We do periodically, I know, at the Cleveland Clinic. So we've also devi devised a right angle tube with active clearance technology, such that now you've got good options for active clearance no matter where in the chest you need to put these. If you need to put them as a right angle, either in the gutter, in the chest space, or in the pericardium behind the right ventricle, straight long tube, that's the XL, standard tube, that of course goes straight into mediastinum. So we all have choices. We should always frame our choices that we make in terms of patient outcomes and safety. And here's the way I think of it. Who should get active clearance? All cardiac surgery patients. That's what we do in my practice. Why should we leave anybody at risk for retained blood, for tamponade, for more post-op AFib? What do we do? Active chest tube management so that we improve outcomes. Where do we put them? In our cases, we always put at least one. If we're doing a robotic right anterior thoracotomy procedure, one in the right chest. Uh, if we're doing a sternotomy, we'll put one in front, and then we usually open the right pleural space and put one there. When, when do we leave them? From the OR until post-op day one. And why do we do it? Primarily to improve outcomes, but the side benefit to improving outcomes is we reduce costs. So thank you very much. That really lays out the problem, the problem is retained blood, which causes complications, reduces patient outcomes, increases costs. The solution is active clearance, and the data shows that it works. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilanoff. Um, that was very concise. I had a couple questions that I think you covered along the way. Um, I guess the only thing I would just throw back at you is, uh, what would you say, again, besides this entire presentation, what would you say to uh, those naysayers out there that, that say, well, I'm not so sure about the data. I'm not so sure about this. I'm not so sure how it, this could actually really affect my post-op AFib rates. Um, what would you say in, in response to those, those thoughts? I would ask you to answer a question honestly. Have you seen tubes that you placed removed filled with clots? I mean, if you have never seen this, I mean, that would only mean you've never done heart surgery because all of us have seen this. So you have to think about your patients and recognize that, yeah, I have put in chest tubes that have failed to work. So the first question is, do you want your chest tubes to work or not? Of course you want them to work. Then the second question uh, into the complications, post-op AFib, this is biologically plausible, meaning it fits together well. We know that inflammation in the pericardial space, mediastinum, can cause post-op AFib. This is used in animal models to study AFib. We know that retained blood causes inflammation. And we have a bunch of studies now that show that when we drain better and have less retained blood, we have less post-op AFib. So it really hangs together as a very nice cause and effect with the solution study. I, I, I tend to agree. Thank you so much again, Dr. Gilanoff. Um, Again, on behalf of everyone at ClearFlow and everyone listening, uh, thank you so much for joining us today and for Dr. Gillenoff for taking uh, time out of his busy schedule to be with us and present this information for us. Um, also, I just want to say, uh, do stand by for a recording of this presentation that will be made available um, shortly and also look out for our next webinar, uh, the fifth in our series, uh, and there will be more details to come on that. Um, so thank you again, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Thanks.